The beta for a company does not come from a regression. It comes from three choices that that company makes. First, what kind of business is it in? Here's the general rule. The more discretionary your product or service is as a company, the higher your beta will be as a company. You say, what do you mean more discretionary? If your customers can live without your product, they can delay buying it, they can defer buying it, you should have a higher beta than if you produce a good or service that's an absolute necessity. A grocery store should have a lower beta than Tiffany's. So that's the first building block for beta. Think about what your company does. Second, tell me something about your cost structure. The greater the proportion of your costs that are fixed costs, the higher your beta will be as a company. Why? Because if you have a lot of fixed costs, good times become great, bad times become terrible. Everything gets magnified. So if you're in a business with a lot of fixed costs, I would expect you to have a higher beta than if you're in a business with low fixed costs. And here's the third and final ingredient. When you borrow money, you create a fixed cost you do not have until you borrow that money, right? It's interest expenses. Interest expenses make your good times even better for equity investors. They make your bad times even worse. They magnify risk again. So the more you borrow, the higher your beta will be as a company. So when I sit down to value a company, rather than looking at a regression page, I start with the fundamentals. What does this company do? What kind of beta would I expect, given what it does? What does its cost structure look like, given, given the business it's in, and how much has it borrowed? Answering those questions is going to give me a much better insight into what the beta for that company should be than looking at a regression and taking the slope of the line as my beta. Now, I'm actually going to use this page as my building block for an alternative to regression betas. I call these bottom-up betas, but don't get thrown off by the terminology. Here's what I'm going to do. Let's say you're a company and you want me to estimate your beta. I'm going to start off by asking you a question. Tell me what business or businesses you're in. So let's play along. Let's assume you tell me you're in the steel and the chemical business. I'll say I'll be back tomorrow. I'm going to go back and find as many publicly traded steel companies and as many publicly traded chemical companies as I can. Because they're publicly traded, I can look up their regression betas. I'm going to average the betas out. I'm going to come up with an average beta across steel companies and average beta across chemical companies. Now, I know that beta can be affected by how much debt these companies have, so I'm going to clean up for that. That's called unlevering the beta. It sounds fancy, but I'm taking out the effect of debt. And what I'll end up with is a pure beta or a business beta for being in the steel and the chemical businesses. And I come back to you and say, tell me what, how much of your value you get from each of these businesses. Now, you might not be able to give me how much value you get, but you can, might be able to give me the revenues you get from each business. I'll take a weighted average. That's going to give me a beta for the businesses you're in as a company. Final question I'm going to ask you is, tell me how much debt and equity you have as a company. You could give me your actual debt to equity ratio. You could give me your target. And I'm going to come up with a beta for your equity based on the businesses you're in and the leverage you've chosen. That's called a bottom-up beta. Now, why am I doing this? Because I don't like regression betas, right? But think about it. Where did I get the betas for all those steel companies and chemical companies? They were regression betas. All I've done is replaced a single regression beta with an average of 100 or 500. So where's the savings? Remember the law of large numbers from statistics? Put crudely, here's what it says. You can take 100 rotten betas, you can average them out, and the average is going to be magically precise. I've always wondered how that happened. But the answer is actually pretty intuitive. When I say the standard error of a beta is high, here's what I'm saying. Some of these betas are overestimated, some are underestimated, right? When I average them out, I average, them, average out my mistakes. That is the biggest selling point for bottom-up betas. A bottom-up beta, because it's an average across many betas, is going to be far more precise than any individual regression beta. Here's the second advantage. If you entered the chemical business yesterday, there is zero chance a regression beta could capture that risk. But if I do a bottom-up beta, I get to set the weights. I can even be proactive. I can bring in businesses you plan to be in, even though you're not in them today. And finally, a bottom-up beta, I can estimate for a private business. I could never do a regression beta for a private business. So I'm actually wedded to bottom-up betas. It's been almost 15 years since I've done a valuation using a regression beta, and that should tell you how strongly I feel about using sector average or bottom-up betas in my valuation. So we've got a beta for a single business company in Briar. Let's, let's up the ante. Let's try a more difficult case. Let's assume you have a company in two businesses. In this case, SAP, which is a German software company. SAP actually classifies itself as being in three businesses. I've kind of condensed them into two. And these are the two businesses I see them in, software 
and consulting. I went and found publicly traded software companies and consulting firms, and I came up with unlevered betas for each of those businesses. It's only one more step left, right? I've got to estimate how much value SAP gets from each of these businesses. Now, looking at SAP's financial statements, I was able to get revenues for each of these businesses. And if I were short of time, I could have used those revenue weights. But when you do that, you're implicitly assuming that a dollar in revenue in one business is worth about the same as a dollar in revenue in the other business. And that might or might not be true, especially if you have different margins. So I added one more layer of estimation detail. Remember those comparable companies from which I got those betas? I also looked up an additional number. I looked to see what multiple of revenues companies in each of these businesses were trading at. So basically, I'm looking to see whether the market is valuing these companies at two times revenues, three times revenues, five times revenues. I applied that multiple of revenues for software companies to the revenues that SAP gets from its software business to get an estimated value for SAP software business. I did the same thing for the consulting business. When I was done, based on my estimates, it looks like SAP is about 80% software, 20% consulting. I use those to come up with a weighted average. That gives me the unlevered beta, the beta for the businesses that SAP is in. So when you talk about unlevered betas, that's what we're talking about, the betas for the businesses you're in. One final step, so I looked up the debt to equity ra ratio for SAP, and SAP is not a company that uses a lot of debt. Its debt to equity ratio is only 1.4%. Using that debt to equity ratio and the German corporate tax rate, I came up with a beta for SAP as a company. That's my estimate for beta. That's what I would use if I were valuing SAP. I would not be using the regression beta. So let me sum up. You want a measure of relative risk. You might not like betas. That's fine. Don't use betas. Give me your alternate. It could be based on accounting measures. It could be based on qualitative measures. All I need is a measure of relative risk. And why do I need that? Without a measure of relative risk, I'm attaching the same discount rate to companies with very different risk profiles. So don't let your disdain for betas lead you down that path. Come up with a measure of relative risk, and everything we've talked about today will still follow through.